Well, now we've come to our twelfth and final time together in this series of God's purpose for the believer. And we've just finished thinking together about this subject of reckoning, counting upon the facts once seen. And we mustn't be tempted to think that reckoning is something magic and that reckoning is the the answer to everything. Reckoning is simply another step in God's wonderful process of conforming us to the image of his son. A very vital step and a step which opens up an entire new realm for the Christian. And reckoning is not a, a method or not a once-for-all crisis, but reckoning is actually an attitude as we see these wonderful facts of identification and learn to rest in these facts and count them so that becomes a set attitude in our thinking attitude of mind and heart as we count these things so. It may be a crisis, often is, where the Christian sees these truths and enters into them and experiences a great sense of relief and freedom. But it is a crisis that merges into a process. It merges into further and more definite growth. And this must be remembered. And often, uh, there is no crisis whatsoever. The Christian just simply sees these truths and begins to count upon them, and for some time nothing happens. But at least he has the satisfaction and the comfort of realizing that he's abiding in God's truth as he sees it, this whole new realm. He accepts it. And often God holds off from giving any results from it for a time uh, so that the Christian will uh, thoroughly examine his motives and examine the truth and make sure where he stands. And also that he will simply be willing, so sure of his truths, that he'll simply be willing to wait. Trusting God. And God allows him to wait often for different reasons, and these might be two of the reasons, often are, where God gives a Christian an opportunity to really make sure. But the thing is, the thing that we must see here is that counting upon our, ourselves being dead indeed unto sin in the Lord Jesus and alive unto God in him opens up a new realm and a new phase of one's processing for growth. And Newell uh, brings out a wonderful point here, William R. Newell. Incidentally, I would like to highly recommend his book, uh, Romans Verse by Verse, if you don't already have it. Of course, many Christians have had it on their shelves for years, and it doesn't mean much to them until they begin to enter into these truths, and then it becomes a treasure. Then the book begins to really open up. But William R. Newell's Romans Verse by Verse, any Christian bookstore, we carry it in our um, literature work here. Incidentally, if we have a book list of oh, probably 30, 40 titles of books, primary books, nothing secondary, we trust, but proven books for Christian growth, and we'd be glad to send you the book list if you just write and ask for it. Uh, so many Christians uh, don't realize, and they spend a lot of time on secondary books or books that would lead them off astray often. Uh, but it's important to uh, spend one's time and reading uh, on things that are proven, things that will really assist in opening up the Word, really that are founded in the truth, in the truth. 
But Newell says that we should be dead unto sin and now alive unto God as risen ones, sharing that newness of life which our Lord Jesus began as the firstborn from among the dead, is at first too wonderful for us. We see in ourselves the old self-life, the flesh, and straightway we forget God's way of faith and turn back to our feelings. It is hard to reckon and keep reckoning that we shared Christ's death to sin and that we are alive unto God in Him. Yet there is no establishing of our lives along any other line. To turn back from sure faith in the facts, uh, the facts that we died with the Lord Jesus and are now alive unto God in Him, is to turn back to what? To the weary, hopeless struggle of Romans 7, seeking to make the flesh obey God, or else back to groanings before God, begging Him to give us personal deliverance. No, we are to stand upon the truth and allow God his time and way to make this truth real in our daily walk. We are to put our hand to the plow, and we are to face his goal for us, and we are to move forward in dependence upon him. In this new realm that is opened up, this process that is opened up through our reckoning, if we turn to Philippians 3, 12. There's a wonderful thing here for us to see. Philippians 3.12 Not as though I had already attained, either were already mature, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now this apprehend, apprehension, ap being apprehended, being taken hold of for a purpose. If you were to be apprehended by the police. But Paul says here, not as though I had already attained, either were already mature, but I follow after, if that I may be ap that I may apprehend, I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And there's a very wonderful truth here that every Christian has been born into the Lord Jesus Christ, has been placed in the Lord Jesus by the Holy Spirit, and by God the Father. Of God are ye in Christ Jesus. And we have been taken hold of by the Lord Jesus, that we might be conformed to his image, that he might be our life in our everyday walk, in our practical experience. And that is God's purpose for the believer. That's what, for which he has been apprehended that God has taken hold of us for this specific reason to make us like his son. And that is what the Christian must see, our position in Christ and God's purpose for us. That's why we are looking into this series to see more clearly God's purpose for us and how he works it out. And as we see that for which we are apprehended, then in our faith we reach out to apprehend that very same thing. Our faith is reaching out for that which he has for us in Christ. There's a meeting of the minds there that we have the mind of Christ. We're after the same thing he is. There's your cooperation. There's your oneness of heart. And Paul says, If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended. It's a very comforting truth to find out what God's after and then we're after the same thing or well, there's a oneness there and we're in the center of God's will and we find out his purpose and that becomes our purpose and there we are it's just that simple seeing the facts and resting in them counting upon them this one thing I do Paul says this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind whether they're failures or victories no matter what forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Growth, progress. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And his high calling is that we may be made, like, made in the image of his Son. Let us make man in our image. And Paul presses toward that mark and he has no other mark. And he's in the center of God's will. He's in God's purpose. And he presses toward it. He allows nothing to hinder him. 
He's leaning toward God. He's leaning into the wind. He's pressing toward the very mark, the target, the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We think of Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And God has completed each of our Christian lives in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life, all before ordained. And then he has created us in the Lord Jesus. His life is our life. And we're his workmanship, for it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, created anew, born anew. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, not produce them, not manufacture them, not struggle to do, walk in them. We're to walk in the Spirit, walk in dependence upon him. And that is why God is taking the Christian through failure and showing him himself so that he'll be willing to turn from himself unto the Lord Jesus as his life, that need and that hunger to press on no matter what. And uh, when we're babes in the Lord Jesus, we're treated as babes. And uh, my one's prayers are answered immediately and one has all kinds of service and one has all the joy and uh, treated as a baby. But when we begin to grow up, the Lord Jesus uh, becomes more firm and there's a matter of discipleship. One must take up his cross, he must hate his own life and take up his cross and follow him. Otherwise he cannot be his disciple. We're to hate our life, the old life that has gotten us into so much trouble, is the old life, the self-life that has been the, the poison in the center of everything. And we're to take up our cross. And our cross is the cross of the Lord Jesus. That's where we died. We died in Christ on Calvary. And when we, one take up this, takes up his cross, he by faith he takes up that cross that he died on. He reckons himself dead indeed unto sin. That's taking up one's cross. Count yourself dead indeed unto sin. You take up the cross by faith. Lord, that's where I died. I uh, count upon that fact. And then the Holy Spirit brings the the finished work of that cross and applies it to our old life. We which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. And the old life is held in the place of death, inoperative. That's taking up one's cross. And as we uh, fail enough and, and uh, begin to really hate our life and realize that we're the ones that's ru that are ruining everything, we are able to glory in the cross as, a, as the Holy Spirit applies the cross to our old life. Uh, Paul says uh, he, would, he would glory in the cross by which the world is crucified unto him and he unto the world. Uh, glory in the cross, not seek to avoid it. And the Lord Jesus says we are to follow, take up our cross and follow him. And that's our cross. Many Christians feel, well, my cross is uh, maybe an illness or a situation in the family. And well, I... I seek to bear my cross for Jesus, and that attitude, and it's it's, it's a negative attitude, it's a self-centered, self-pitying attitude, and that is not taking up one's cross at all. Taking up one's cross is a, is a doctrinal thing in the first place of, a, of making application to the truth that there we died on the cross of Calvary, and by faith we take that cross up, we count ourselves dead indeed on the cross, and then that death is given to us in our daily walk by the Holy Spirit. He ministers the cross. We cannot crucify ourselves. He's the one who takes us through this situation and that circumstance. And he applies the death to keep self out of the picture that the Lord Jesus might be our all, that we might grow. And we mustn't forget that uh, reckoning is, has two parts. It's a dual belief that we reckon we count ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin we also count ourselves to be alive unto God in Christ, that we're risen now in Christ, and we count ourselves in Him. We uh, abide in Him. It's our attitude that we know that we're in Him, and we're just the branch resting and abiding in the vine, and that brings the growth. 
The first half of the reckoning of Romans 6.11 brings death to the old and releases us from the domination of self and sin and the world and Satan. And then, as we count on the other half, we rest in his life. The Lord Jesus is free to manifest himself. Not I, but Christ. The two parts. And if we move over from uh, down, or back up a ways from uh, Philippians 3.12, we move back up to Philippians 3.10 wonderful verse that we're all familiar with and this is part of the process that results from reckoning Philippians 3.10 we know uh, we've dwelt upon this subject time and time again in our series here about knowing him this is eternal life that we might know the father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent the knowledge of God. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That I may know him with Paul's hunger and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And he's a resurrected Lord and we're, uh, we're resurrected in him. We're on resurrection ground. Brought up out of death in newness of life. And as we know him, we must know him in that, on that ground. The power of his resurrection has brought us up out of death. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And of course, as a Christian rests in the risen Lord, the process that he's taken through in daily Christian life, as the old life is held in the place of death as there, as there is a daily crucifixion dying daily dying to the old in our experience because of the facts that happened at Calvary we learn more and more of the fellowship of his sufferings and he's a suffering savior and the Christian is learns what it means to suffer it may not only be physical suffering but mental suffering and spiritual anguish burdens for others and all all of these things and we uh, enter into the sufferings of others and we, we learn something about suffering so that we understand what others are going through all of these things it makes the Christian more like the Lord Jesus it, it's the life of the Lord Jesus it, he's, a, he's a compassionate individual he's patient with others he understands that's our Christian development fellowship of his sufferings and being made conformable unto his death that the old life is taken into death daily down and there's a that death that we died in him is made real in our walk here as the finished work is applied to the old life and we're made conformable unto his death it's a continuous process and out of that death springs the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and this is a process down with the old up with the new so to speak as self is held in the place of death, the Lord Jesus is on the throne in one's life and he's more and more manifest in and through the Christian. And as one learns to reckon, one uh, is brought into the realm of 2 Corinthians 4, 11, and 12, which is the new realm, the same as the new realm of Philippians 3.10, the processing realm, resulting from reckoning. And this area here in 2 Corinthians 4, is the same thing, the result of one's reckoning. This wonderful, wonderful verse, these two verses here, Second Corinthians 4, 11, and 12. For we which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, our mortal flesh, here and now. And the Christian is the living one. He's the one who has life. And there's the paradox that the living one is delivered into death. Like the corn of wheat being dropped into the ground and dying. That there's an element of death to the old life. It's held out of the picture more and more. And God does this through everyday circumstances and through association with people and all the situations that one is taken into. And uh, the person is crucified. The old life is... Uh, dealt with 
and it's simply the finished work that uh, the old life went down into death at Calvary. That finished work is being applied now. And the reason for it is for Jesus' sake, His glory, and not for anything uh, for ourselves. And the reason for it also is that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And that's the very purpose of God, that we might be more like Him, that He might manifest Himself in and through us. But that takes death to get the old life out of the way, that the new life might flourish. And the twelfth verse says, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And as the self-life is kept out of the way, the life of the Lord Jesus is uh, flowing by the Holy Spirit, flowing out to others. And others live, others receive life as we in our old life die. And there's your harvest from your corn of wheat falling into the ground and die. There are 30, 30, 60, 100 fold of new corns of wheat are being born and harvested. And that's the process. The process that results from reckoning. All of this process is worked out in Romans 8, 28 and 29. All things are working together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The way up is down, and the resurrection life, uh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, this resurrection life must spring out of death, death to the old. And the, we think of the uh, oak tree, the mighty oak. In the first place, it's usually a real mighty oak, is probably 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 years old. And that oak tree has been standing all this time in its grave. It has sprung out of its death. The acorn had to disintegrate and die before the life of this oak could be produced and released. And the oak just uh, settled its roots right in its uh, grave. It actually received its nourishment out of its death. And it's exactly the picture for the Christian. If he wants to be, if he's to be a mighty oak, if he's to be strong in the Lord, and not just a willow tree halfway falling into the stream, the first strong wind that comes along. Branches falling all over the place. No, a mighty oak. And the Christian realizes that he's a corn of wheat also, and he's, uh, he's willing to just uh, be sown where the Lord Jesus wants to sow him, and he'll just settle down in his grave and rest there. And out of that circumstance and that rest and faith, brings the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus flowing out to others. And this is losing one's life, that, he might, that one might keep it. But if we seek to save our life and keep it away from death, there's no, except a, fall, a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. And if we seek to save our life, we lose all the fruit. There's no harvest. It, we abide alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And part of this processing to work all this out is, is in the realm of chastening. If we can turn to Hebrews 12, 11. A very wonderful truth here that often the Christian is chastened and he thinks something's absolutely wrong and he's being punished and he's all upset, whereas it's simply part of the processing from his reckoning that results from his reckoning. It's, it's the outworking of his reckoning. It is the process of his growth. Hebrews 12, 11. Uh, God chastens us for our profit. All things work together for good, uh, that we might be partakers of his holiness, uh, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chastened, that's the reason for chastening. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, when one is in the processing of it, it's hard to be joyous. No chasing for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. One takes up his cross, he's going to meet death. There's going to be crucifixion. And one must be ready for it. And chastening is a result of one's reckoning. One's taking up his cross. One's counting himself dead indeed unto sin take up one's cross and follow the Lord Jesus there's going to be chastening he chastens sons if a Christian is not chastened uh, he may he may be a better examine himself he may be a bastard he may not be a true son at all chastening is a proof of sonship and it's wonderful to realize that chastening is not 
has nothing to do with punishment or anger. The Lord Jesus has borne the wrath for sin. Uh, chastening, the word chastening in the Greek means child training. And uh, our Father of mercies is, cha is training his children. He's taking us through death unto life. And chastening means child training. He child trains us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no child training for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Thereby we think the day of raising children. And if they're brought up in the admonition and the nurture of the Lord, they're going to be strong, God-fearing children in time. And they're going to love their parents. And there has to be a definite child training in love for their profit. And the fruit may not appear until later, but later it'll be there. Nevertheless, they may scream and cry and uh, all sorts of things at the moment. And nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit. Fruit means growth, not production, not works. Peaceable fruit, result of, fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Well, when a Christian seeks to save his life and to avoid the cross and uh, seeks to keep from being exercised by any chastening, of course he is not going to have the peaceful fruit of righteousness in his life. He may have plenty of the works of self, works of the flesh, uh, but he won't have uh, any predominance of the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the life of the Lord Jesus manifested in his life because it'll be the self-life living and dominating. He's saving his life. But if he's willing to lose his life, the old life, by the work of the cross, being made conformable unto his death, then the life of the Lord Jesus, his new life, the new creation, will flourish, and he'll be living and abiding in the Lord Jesus. He'll be a happy, fruitful Christian. And there's a matter of testimony in this chastening, not only a matter of growth, where Paul says that uh, now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. And there are other Christians around us, and they're the unsaved around us that are, who are watching us. And when God uh, child trains the Christian and chastens him and deals with him in love, in mercy, for his growth, for his profit, for his good, uh, it's not any time for the Christian to drop his hands and to become despondent and uh, his knees uh, feeble where he's not walking a straight path, going in circles of self-pity, uh, loss of testimony and all? No. If he realizes what the chastening is for and what God's doing, he can straighten up and praise the Lord. There may be keen suffering. He, his, his rest and his praise is not in his circumstances, is not in the actual chastening, because no cha chastening seemeth uh, to be joyous, but grievous at the time. But he can be thankful in the Lord Jesus Christ. He can praise the Lord. He can have a peace and rest in the Lord Jesus. Not only for what he's doing, but for the fact of who he is and our relationship to him, no matter whether we're being chastened or not. He doesn't change. His attitude toward us doesn't change, and we can rejoice in him no matter what. We can't always rejoice in our circumstances, but we always rejoice in him. So we're to lift up the hands which hang down on the feeble knees and make straight paths for our feet. If for nothing more, for testimony, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Those about us who need help, who need a testimony, who need courage in the Lord, uh, they won't be turned out of the way. If we walk straight and rejoice, they'll see who he is and what he means when there's pressure and chastening. But if uh, the Christian flounders and is full of self-pity and doesn't know what's happening, he's all frustrated, he's going to affect those who are watching him adversely. And we 
think of uh, Philippians 1.19, for instance. That the Holy Spirit is the one who applies these truths. He is the one. So we think of um, Philippians 1.19, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And He's sufficient. He's the one who gives us the things of the Lord Jesus. By the daily supply of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus, the believer, uh, united to the risen Lord, grows continually to a more perfect knowledge and likeness of his Creator, and grows up after the image of him that created him, in the sphere where Christ is all and in all. The child naturally grows up in the likeness of his Father, and the new life communicated to the redeemed Christian grows up in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Creator of the new creation. If so be that the death with Christ is unflinchingly recognized, and the old things are truly allowed to pass away, to make room for the growth of the new man, which is after God, created in righteousness and holiness. As self is held in the place of death, the Lord Jesus is free to flourish in our lives. And this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And the Holy Spirit responds to our faith in the facts, and he makes those facts real in our daily walk. And as we reckon ourselves dead indeed into sin, in our daily walk we become separated from the domination of sin by death. Death is the great separator. Death is complete. And death, the Holy Spirit applies that finished work of death to the old life, and we're freed from its domination progressively as we grow. And as we're free from the domination and the civil war of the old, we're free to abide in the Lord Jesus. And of course, the Christian who does not know anything about the identification truths and does not know how to take up his cross and does not know how to count himself dead indeed in the sin. Uh, at best, his is the up and down uh, experience. One moment it's self and one moment it's the Lord Jesus. And he's just up and down continually and he, he's just uh, distracted. And no maintained walk at all. But the Christian who's learning to count himself dead and deed into sin and alive unto God and the Lord Jesus is progressively, uh, progressively more free from the domination of the old and progressively more controlled by the Spirit of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's walking in the Spirit. He's controlled by the Holy Spirit whose ministry is to manifest the life of the Lord Jesus in us. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And there's no struggle there. Remember our verse way back in 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord in the Word, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, from experience to experience, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And then we think of Romans 8, 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the law of the old life the law of the first Adam nothing but sin and death and of course the law of the last Adam the law of the Lord Jesus Christ the, spirit, the law of the spirit of Christ the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that law is the law of life and righteousness as over against the law of sin and death and of course the where sin abounded grace did much more abound the law of the spirit is stronger than the law of sin the law of life in Christ is stronger than the law of death. And as we learn to abide in the Lord Jesus, 
the law of the spirit takes over and produces life, the life of the Lord Jesus. And this is all included in the process, the daily process that will go on as long as we're in this body, as long as we're on this earth and, and we're looking into the Lord Jesus Christ. We're off looking into Jesus. We're um, beholding as in a glass, in the Word, the glory of the Lord Jesus. As we look to Him, there is growth. And just as the, a tree grows, actually only really grows uh, several months out of the year, the rest of the year, there is a rest and there is a solidification of that which has been produced in the few months. Well, much of the Christian development is the same way. It's not all at a high speed, high geared. There are phases. There is a time when it seems like we're going backward, let, or not, let alone going forward. There's a time when the Christian is in a desert area where he just uh, loses all he just can't pray. He loses all hunger for the Word. He just can't get anywhere. Well, that's the time to simply rest in God's faithfulness. It's not... Uh, what kind of faith is it that if we only rejoice in God and only be uh, have confidence in Him when He's blessing and everything's happening, we're going forth full speed and all kinds of fruit in the life and all kinds of service carried out then we're happy then we're praising the Lord then we're confident in Him then we love Him and when He personally takes us down for our development our child training takes us down into the desert area where all is dry and hard and the blinding sun and there's no and the heat and no progress and there's a thirst no water that type of experience then we say well there's uh, something gone wrong and God isn't taking care of me and we're crying out to God to get us out of this and to bless us and we're just trying to we're fighting against God we're, we're, we're frustrating the purpose of God in our thinking at least because we're not uh, realizing that he's still God he's still our father that he's still the father of mercy he's still carrying out his purpose that all things are working together for good for the Christian, whether it's desert or whether it's uh, in the middle of a garden. And he wants us to realize that we can rejoice in him at all times. And there has to be these desert times and desert periods. has to be these quiet periods of seeming uselessness. All of this is part of the development. And the Christian, when he begins to get into a desert period, he fights and works all the harder to keep busy and to serve all the harder. And he uh, He's simply spinning his wheels. He's simply not resting in the Lord Jesus. He's so afraid what others will think. Well, you're not busy for the Lord. Well, what's the matter? And you're not praying. You're not studying the Word. You're not witnessing. You're not winning souls. All of these things he, he seeks to keep up for appearance's sake. And he's forgetting that uh, God knows how to develop him and bring him along. And God has his way. And God is uh, sovereign in this universe. And he's already created this Christian's life in the Lord Jesus. He knows what he's doing. And he knows how to do it. And it's time for the Christian to rest in the sovereignty of God. Rest in the purpose of God. And to rejoice in the fact that God will not fail. All he has to do is simply abide in the vine. And there'll be, there'll be plenty of activity. Matter of fact, a Christian will be uh, contended to go into a desert uh, sphere and a phase and get some rest. He'll need it. There won't be any laziness or lack of activity to the one who rests and abides in the Lord Jesus. And what activity there is will be infinitely more f fruitful than all the nervous energy expended by the struggling, busy Christian. The barren of busyness. Barrenness of busyness. No, the Christian who finds out and gets to know the Lord Jesus Christ and gets to know his Father, the Father of mercies, he understands how God does things and what God is is busy at and what God has already done in, on his behalf in the Lord Jesus. 
and what his position is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he can afford to be at peace, not a frantic, busy, excited Christian dashing here and there and raising all sorts of clouds of spiritual dust getting in everyone's eyes making all sorts of claims pushing and pulling everyone this way and that way stirring everything up not satisfied to wait those are the Christians we need less of in our churches in our meetings here and there, on the mission field, in the pulpit, in the home. These dear unsaved husbands, for instance, with a frantic, busy wife, seeking to get him saved and uh, seeking to get him to run the home and take the leadership. And the poor man, uh, he gets such a distaste for Christian life that he can't stand the thought of coming to the Lord Jesus Christ with all of this flurry around him. And the same with the Christian man who may have a Christian wife or may not have a Christian wife and family, but he's so busy for the Lord, he's, he's out at church meetings every other night or every night of the week, and he's uh, his wife is a church widow. She's a Christian widow. The children are Christian orphans. And he's so busy for the Lord that he can't even formulate and maintain a Christian home which is even more important than church, than a church. Uh, a church is no better than the Christian homes it represents. Never. But we've centered everything in our churches and we've lost our homes as Christians. We wonder why our children, when they get to be 16 and 17 and 18, that's all, brother, their attitude is, I'm leaving. I'm getting out of this tree, they say. And they're gone. We wonder what's the matter, where we failed. They never had a Christian home. And so many of them uh, that react like that, they had a Christian home all right, and they were forced forced into everything and uh, pushed into everything. No, dear friends, it's the resting, patient, suffering, rejoicing, trusting Christian, whether it's a mother or a father, a son or a daughter, in a home who is going to be a pillar in the church. And there needn't be all this frantic activity to carry out the ministry of the quiet, peaceful, holy spirit. He carries out his own ministry through Christians, and he does it in a quiet, Christ-centered, Christ-glorifying, God-honoring way. And when the lost about us begin to see these things, they become interested because they're sick and tired of the rush and the madness of this world. And they're looking for rest, but they'll never find that rest in a half-mad Christian, frantic Christian, never. And of course, the Christian who is all tired out from rushing around half his Christian life and he's looking for some rest, he's never going to find it apart from truth, correct doctrine, these truths of his position in the Lord Jesus Christ, these truths of what the work of Calvary has done in his behalf in taking this frantic, mad, rushing old nature into death. Death will quiet it down. Death will hold it inoperative. But that's the only thing that will. The death of Calvary, of counting ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are the truths that a Christian must rest in before he can really gain the benefit of them in his daily walk. First comes the knowledge, first comes the truth, first comes the Bible and the Christian life. The Lord Jesus had to go to the cross and do all this work before he could produce Christians, real Christians, born-again Christians, those who are members of his body, which is the church. <clears throat> All the work had to be done first. The seed corn had to be produced perfect before it could multiply into others. And he is the seed corn. And he went down into the earth. He died and went down into the earth. 
and he rose again and every Christian is in him that brings peace that brings quiet that brings the joy that circumstances cannot shake or alter these are the Christians that we need in our churches and in our homes Christians who know Christians who are apprehending that for which they were apprehended of Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus and we mustn't forget that this takes time once the truths are seen and rested upon then begins the process once we come to Calvary and see that we are identification with the Lord Jesus there then begins the process and as we think of Philippians 3.10 and 2 Corinthians 4.11 and 2 Corinthians 3.18 as we study the word and see the Lord Jesus in the word there's that uh, being conformed to his image by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and of course he uses everyday life to do it all things are working together for good to them that love God for we which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh so then death worketh in us but life in others that is the process springing from our resting upon the truth the truth goes to work the truth has an effect upon one's everyday life because truth is something that is real something that happened the truth of the word already happened and we get the results of it through faith that's what happened when we were saved we simply believed in the Lord Jesus and what he had done instantly we had our salvation instantly we were in Christ instantly if we were uh, well taught and, and uh, really born again instantly we knew that we were we had escaped hell and that we were heaven was ours we knew that that very day we simply entered into all that which was already done for us and we knew it we gained the benefit of it and it's the same thing here for our walk as well as for our birth then now it's for our walk that we find out these truths and we know them and we rest upon them then we begin to gain the benefit of them not I but Christ well dear friends this has been a wonderful time together I, it's done me a lot of good to gather this material and pray over it and share it and I trust that we'll hear from you sometime by mail maybe we can have some further fellowship through correspondence the Lord has had us in this work for well over 20 years it's a wonderful means of fellowship so won't you feel free at any time to write us about these things our Father we thank thee for this time that we've had together we thank thee for the work of the cross we thank thee for the life of the Lord Jesus Christ we thank thee for the work of the Holy Spirit as he teaches us these things and as he applies them in our daily life how we thank thee father for thy faithfulness as thou dost make us in thine own image uh, conforming us to the image of thy son the lord jesus christ we thank thee for this in his precious name amen <laughs>